So let's uh, continue this morning with um, some um, important uh, products uh, which are related and usually made by uh, same uh, production uh, mills, uh, the uh, wire products and the, the bar products. And, um, and, and review uh, quickly um, what we said uh, last time that um, about the, the main applications basically for these uh, wire products. So um, we had tire cord steel, which, which ends up um, uh, in tires, obviously, called uh, heading quality steels, spring steels, bearing steels, and free cutting steels. And then here are a number of examples of these applications. In all the cases, we saw that um, metallurgical cleanliness of the material was extremely important because very small number of um, inclusions, oxide inclusions, hard oxide inclusions, can lead to uh, the uh, early failure uh, in fatigue mainly of um, components made with these uh, wire products. And then you have um, uh, the bar products, hmm? um, and uh, the main uh, applications for uh, bars, uh, and I would say uh, quality bars, uh, is our shafts, in particular crankshafts, carburized gears, um, uh, induction hardenable steels for heat treatment, stabilizing bars, and heavy springs. In addition, I don't mention here, but we'll talk about this at the end of the lecture today, uh, are of course the, the, re, the simple commercial rebars that are uh, made um, for the construction industry. Again, uh, what, what you find in many of these applications is a, uh, an emphasis on cleanliness of the uh, the microstructure, so absence of oxide inclusions. And the reason is, of course, uh, because many of these parts are in applications where you get cyclic loading, and so uh, you get fatigue issues. And, um, and these are some examples. An example of a, of a crankshaft uh, fatigue uh, uh, problem and a, um, another shaft uh, in torsional fatigue. The, uh, and as I said, um, part of these uh, fatigue problems are, are, are addressed by, uh, by using heat treatable uh, materials, bars, uh, which will uh, be surface heat treated, carburized for instance, to improve their fatigue lives, but you know, even in that, in that case, uh, the issue of fatigue uh, is, is, uh, is very important, remains very important. All right. This is just uh, a table. It's just for your information. Um, uh, there, there are, if, if you look at, at the products, there's, of course, more than these 10 important classes of products. Uh, for instance, uh, an important uh, application for wire is, is welding rod, right? Welding rod. Uh, um, uh, and, and, and other special applications. And so what, what we'll do uh, today is actually look into the, um, uh, the, the, the typical applications, yes? And um, you will see that um, these products are relatively simple in the sense that in terms of chemistry, we're basically talking about uh, very important role of carbon as alloying element in general in these materials. And we'll, we'll see this is uh, uh, particularly the case for the um, chrome and moly. Uh, particularly the case for wire products, yes? 
um, with and, and the microstructure is, is then usually uh, ferrite uh, perlite microstructure. If you want to achieve higher strengths, yes, you go to uh, uh, martensitic microstructures. Yeah? Martensitic, yeah. And in that case, you need to add hardenability agents, and, and those are, uh, of course, uh, chromium and molybdenum. And uh, as I already said uh, uh, at the end of the uh, last time we met, uh, these, uh, these products, these wire products, are some of the uh, uh, highest strength materials uh, available, um, steel products available currently. We uh, discussed also the, the way the, uh, you could obtain uh, a paralytic microstructure even though you had off perlite compositions. Hmm? Uh, and uh, if I, and we also uh, said that so the temperature at which we had the fastest uh, uh, perlite reaction, yes, perlite uh, uh, formation was in the temperature range of uh, here 550 to 600 degrees C. So that's going to be an important temperature to get. Um, uh, uh, very fine uh, microstructures. Hmm? Now, why would, why would we make this effort to um, to control this uh, the um, uh, these um, the interlamellar spacing hmm? and the, and the refinement of the martensite? It's basically because of strength. So, a, a microstructure where you have a small interlamellar spacing is much stronger than one with a larger one. The, um, and, uh, and the way we obtain it, as I just said, is by doing the transformation, uh, eutectoid transformation with a larger undercooling. The microstructure is, is however, yes, uh, basically uh, unstable hmm, in the sense that you can see that uh, when you have a fine uh, microstructure, prolytic microstructure, you will um, have more boundaries, uh, uh, cementite, ferrite boundaries, than if you have a coarse microstructure. So there is a, a driving force for the perlite uh, microstructure to leave this lamellar microstructure. And we'll use this um, when we heat treat the, um, the perlite to make a very soft material it's, that will allow us to make, uh, for instance, bowls. Um, uh, so we can machine uh, and form the bowls before we make them very strong. Okay. Right, so and this is an example here of the relation between uh, the, the, the temperature at which you do the transformation. So uh, this is the temperature axis, and this is the growth rate of the um, perlite. Hmm? Uh, 720 is about the eutectoid temperature. Right? So if you uh, do the, uh, the, the reaction very close to this temperature, the, uh, the growth rate is very slow, yeah, very slow. And uh, the growth rate increases, as I said, uh, around 600 in the range of 550 to 600. There you have a maximum growth rate. Yes. And if you look at the corresponding uh, interlamellar spacing, yeah, so this is the, the transformation, the temperature at which you do the transformation, and here you do the interlamellar spacing, you see that you can get a tenfold decrease in the interlamellar spacing hmm? uh, when, when you do this, uh, the transformation at uh, 600 rather than at 700, okay? So very important to do uh, the transformation at lower temperature, okay? The kinetics of this transformation is, is well known 
and uh, it, uh, for those who are interested in the physical metallurgy of this transformation, it follows the, um, um, the well-known uh, JMK, uh, Johnson Mail Avrami, JMA, excuse me, uh, uh, relation, yes, which, which is shown here, but we won't go into this. So basically, um, when we have, say, a, um, a um, cold heading steel, yes, which will have, uh, you know, uh, carbon content uh, a little bit uh, hypoeutectoid, yes, uh, and you do the transformation to make your uh, a prolytic microstructure. Hmm? You, uh, so this would be the uh, equilibrium phase diagram here. This would, this is your uh, your TTT diagram. Hmm? Uh, the transformation. Uh, starts in principle here when you reach uh, this line and is uh, very sluggish yes uh, w when you go from this temperature to uh, this temperature here um, you will only get uh, ferrite formation yes no no perlite formation in this region uh, because you don't get remember the condition the right condition for growth of uh, the cementite and the ferrite at the same time, hmm? which requires you to transfer the carbon from uh, the um, uh, ferrite region to the um, cementite. Hmm? So you form ferrite here. Yes. And then if you do the, trans if you, uh, uh, below this temperature, you have the right conditions to form a perlite, and that's when you s will see the uh, the perlite transformation. Okay. So, so, so the uh, the perlite transformation doesn't start at this temperature, right? So you need to undercool enough to get uh, below this so-called AECM line, as we uh, discussed last time. Right. Okay. So, um, in general, when uh, let's just now uh, look at specifics. Uh, and, uh, products, yes. Um, with uh, wire products, as I said, let's say uh, so most wire products yeah, are in this uh, range of uh, chemistries, iron, carbon, very simple. Um, and the range of carbon constants go goes from really low values, yes, if you make a very soft wire, to uh, a close to 1%, yes, uh, for instance, for ball bearings. Yes, which are very hard and very wear resistant. So it's a very wide range of, um, of strengths. And so in these uh, uh, types of materials, what, we, what you basically get uh, is that the strength yes, will go from these low values at low carbon to very high values yes, at very high carbon. The, the only reason that you had this, this increase in strength is basically carbon addition, yeah? However, um, <coughs> in the, right, so you remember this triangle here, in, for these compositions, yes, yes, so around the eutectoid composition, yes, you have an additional way of increasing the strength. And that is by deforming, yes, getting, uh, uh, deforming or refining by deformation the perlite microstructure. Hmm? And, and that's, that can be done, that's generally done by drawing, hmm? by drawing and uh, of course a um, uh, major uh, case uh, where you do drawing and achieve very high strengths is uh, tire cord. So here you see so around 0.8% of carbon. As I increase the strain, yes, I can also achieve strengthening without changing the composition. Hmm? And you see that um, uh, the same uh, chemistry, yes, if the interlamellar spacing is about one micron, I, I can achieve strengths that are of the order of 
1500. If I have very large strains of five, that's a very high strain, um, my, uh, my uh, interlamellar spacing can go down to about, uh, what is it, 50 nanometers, and then I can achieve uh, you know, strengths of the order of 4,000 megapascal. So that's very considerable, and it's, it's just a, a purely refinement of the microstructures. There's no, um, so no, no chemistry involved or anything. Hmm? So let's look at a few examples now. And in particular, a uh, nice example uh, of um, uh, uh, application for wire steel are, are the cold heading qualities. Hmm? And uh, what we basically talk about is nuts and bolts, hmm? bolts in particular. And the, the, the chemistry is about from 0.3 to 0.5 in carbon. Hmm? So when the wire is made by the wire mill, in the steel plants, um, uh, this is the microstructure you have. It's ferrite, perlite microstructure. And um, the, the microstructure of this um, high strength pole is a, uh, is not ferrite perlite, it's actually martensite, yes? And, and it's much higher strength than this uh, original uh, initial microstructure. So what, what, how does, you know, how do we go from one uh, situation to the other situation? Well, um, well first, uh, well, uh, you, um, uh, in particular for this bolt here, this type of bolt in particular, um, you have this medium carbon uh, steel and chrome and moly are added to uh, to obtain a martensitic microstructure. Hmm? And these are typical ranges of uh, compositions, hmm? uh, carbon compositions, uh, chrome, and moly. Hmm? And, and these are very typical examples, uh, GIS standard, uh, European standard, and AISI standards for materials that are being used to make high quality bowls. Hmm? Remember, uh, uh, your, your GIS standards, S stands for steel, C stands for chrome, M stands for moly, and the 40 here stands for the amount of carbon. Hmm? Hmm? And um, in the European norm, you can also see about 0.42 of, uh, of um, chromium. The advantage here with the European norms is, of course, that this number here tells you how much chrome you have. And, but, uh, but you know you have to divide this number by four, yes? Unless there is an X here. Hmm? So about 0.1%, uh, 1% of chrome, excuse me. And this is the AISI uh, 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 number. And this is the, the 40, stands for the uh, carbon content times 40. Hmm? And, and these are general composition ranges um, for this type of, of steels. Um, to make these uh, high quality, high strength balls. So how do we get there? What's the process? So the, 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 the wire uh, mill will make wire rod, yes? A, a bunch of wire rod. Um, and um, for instance, of this composition, and the strength of this material will be 900 to about 1100 megapascal, okay? Okay, what happens to this material? First stage is um, the material is softened, hmm? is softened uh, to 700 megapascal so that we can easily draw it, yes? wire drawing. And then the next step is it's ferrodized. So hmm? the, uh, the original uh, uh, perlite is turned into uh, into spherodite. And this happens a first customer. That's the customer who makes the wire that can be turned into um, a, a bolt. Yeah. You have a first a, a soft annealing, which uh, prepares, makes the material softer for the wire drawing. And then you have spherodizing. We'll look into detail a little bit more why 
why we have this type of uh, uh, unexpected uh, um, thermal treatment, okay, where, where you go above the A1 temperature, which is kind of counterintuitive because you would dissolve the cementite rather than spherodize it if you do this. So we'll see how, uh, the details of this. Okay, so at the end of, of this, uh, customer one has this uh, material that's heat treated and uh, uh, drawn once. That goes into the, another customer, hmm? this customer, which is the, the, the actual bold manufacturer. Hmm? That plant makes, will cold form the, uh, your, the bolt, yes, and then there will be a quench and tempering, uh, so austenitizing quench and tempering of these individual bolts to get the, the final strength. So, and this is the heat treatment, you austenitize, you quench, and then you do the tempering. Hmm? And the, um, the, the forming of the bolt itself, it's, it's a whole uh, specialty, uh, because you need, um, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll show you some details um, in a moment. Yeah? So first customer gets this wire, soft anneal it, draw it, spherodize it, and make spherodize wire. Hmm? So what, what basically turns into is, um, this would be the starting microstructure. In this case, uh, it's not, the example is not for a bolt, but it's for a one, like you can tell because it's got 1% of carbon, so that it would be more a, um, a, b a ball bearing steel, a bearing steel, yes. Uh, but anyway, it, it, you'd, you'd see the same. If when it's ferrodized, it becomes very soft, 500 to 600 uh, 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 megapascal. Hmm? Right. And uh, the time it takes to ferrodize a wire is, is, a, is long. It doesn't, it does, it's not a very fast process. So, um, for instance, a... Um, uh, iron carbon, pure iron carbon, uh, to have a, uh, so this is the fraction spherodize, and a fully spherodize means one, uh, yes, at, so it's at 600 degrees C, you can see it takes me an annealing time, this is a log scale, right, uh, it's over 100 hours. So we're talking literally a you know, few days to, to get the microstructure uh, fully uh, spherodized. Um, if you have a, um, alloying elements, in particular chromium, you remember chromium is um, an element we will add to uh, wire steel to make a martensitic microstructures in your products, yes? The, uh, this spherodizing is even slower. Why would that be? Well, it's simply because the chromium has to partition yes, and, and also move around um, as the, um, the, um, um, the um, cementite spherodizes. Hmm? Okay. So, so in this customer number one, you do a soft annealing. That is basically you heat up, yeah, to uh, coarsen the microstructure, remove all kinds of uh, stresses, yes, and use soft annealing. That takes uh, about 15 hours. Um, the reason is, in this particular case, is because the wire, that uh, bundle that comes from the uh, wire mill, is put into batch annealing furnaces. Hmm? So you stack them on top of each other, and you use a batch annealing furnace uh, which is very similar to the batch annealing furnace that you use in um, uh, for hot strip mills, excuse me, cold strip mills, um, except s smaller sizes. Hmm? You will see here that for the spherodizing, you start, you do actually cross over the AC1 temperature, hmm? so um, which is the temperature at which you dissolve, you actually dissolve the um, uh, cementite. And the reason is, right, so this, these are other uh, pictures here um, of this, this annealing. You can see the bundles here. 
uh, being stacked, different type of uh, bundles. Um, and, and this is the, the bell uh, cover going over uh, the entire um, furnace. So what happens uh, during the spherodizing here, in the first stage, your cementite will partially dissolve. That's the idea, yes? And um, the leftover cementite will act as seeds, yes? So that the, when you cool down here, you get a growth of the cementite from these seeds. And instead of having uh, perlite, you just basically form, grow these um, cementite seeds. Now, um, having said this, uh, there are different viewpoints of how uh, spherodizing actually happens, yes? And you can see, uh, if you look at the microstructure evolution with time of the spherodizing process, you can see here the cementite uh, lamellas, and here you see, if you interrupt the spherodizing, you see that they're in these spherodized, uh, and these, uh, excuse me, um, Cementite lamellas are now interrupted before being uh, spherical, yes? And so there are different models which try to explain how this works, you know? <coughs> whereby, you know, um, for instance, one model uh, says that, okay, well, these lamellas themselves become cylindrical and then break up into spherical uh, cementite particles. And, um, and there are other models, and, and people have studied this, um, to, to explain the, the kinetics of the um, spherodite formation. Okay, but so let's uh, now look at our spherodized material. It's still, it's wire, yes? It comes into uh, the uh, production unit for the uh, bolt manufacturing, and so the first thing you do is just cut it in small bits. Yeah? So you have these, you, you basically cut little pieces off, yes, of this annealed bar, and you start uh, turning it into a, a bolt, yeah? Um, so, uh, and so you have uh, different steps, uh, upsetting, trimming, and thread rolling. Mm? These are all um, forming operations, yes? Uh, and, and once you have your, your final bolt, you go, you austenitize these bolts. And uh, sometimes, if required, you can do else forming. You can actually, uh, before you quench this, or in between the, the, the austenite, austenitization, and the quench, you can actually, as you cool, do an additional plastic deformation. It depends on uh, uh, what you want to, uh, to achieve. So you can do a, and, and when you do this, you, this process of deforming the austenite before it transforms, you call that os forming. So os forming. And, uh, and of course, um, uh, after this os forming, if it's done, you quench and then you temper the material. So from a, um, a material that is very soft at the beginning, yeah, less than 700 megapascal in strength, we, we end up with a quenched and tempered uh, martensitic microstructure, 1400 to 1600 megapascal in strength. Hmm? And um, so uh, just for your information, um, you, if you look at these bolts, these high quality bolts, yes, um, uh, you will see that uh, uh, there are numbers on them and letters, yes. Uh, that's how you can tell, first of all, that you have bought a high quality bolt, yes. If there is no, if this detail is not on there, uh, you probably. Uh, do, did not buy high quality bolts, yes? Um, the, no, the lettering refers to 
uh, the company who produced the bolt. Yes? And the, the numbers here uh, help you to identify the strength of the bolts. Yes? So in engineering practice, uh, when, you, when you're building something, you just don't go out to the hardware store to buy some bolts. Okay? Your bolts must have specific strengths. Okay? So if you go around, just uh, look at uh, equipment at GFT, particularly the heavier equipment, you will see that all the bolts have uh, heads with um, uh, numbers on them. Uh, so, um, so if anything goes wrong, um, uh, and, it, you know, and it could be due to the bolt, uh, this can always be... The, the bolt manufacturer can be um, uh, traced back, or the the company who used the wrong strength uh, for a particular application can can also be um, asked questions. So, um, 88. What does 88 mean? So it tells you two things. It tells you the UTS of the the bolt. Eight times hundred is uh, 800 uh, megapascal. And the yield strength is given by 8 times 8 times 10, so 640. So you know exactly uh, what bolt you have, yes? Uh, this one here has 6.5. The first digit you multiply by 100 gives you UTS. And first and second times 10, 300 gives you the, the yield strength of your bolt. Yeah? So these are very important design aspects of um, of bolts and, and any mechanical engineering structure. So um, uh, that's why the, the information on the bolts is really important. Okay. When, so that's for, for um, bolts. Um, typic a very uh, important wire uh, application, wire steel application. The, uh, let's increase the carbon content to come into the realm of the, the spring steels. There, so the carbon content there uh, is from, say, 0.5 to 0.7. So uh, 0.5 up to the eutectoid composition. And, and these are typical applications here. This is a suspension spring. This is a, a, a small uh, uh, leaf spring. And, and these are um, valve springs for uh, cars. So the, all these products are basically originally um, uh, wire steel. So, of course, there are many different wire steel. These are the most important ones. Hmm? Um, and you can see, for instance, the, the very first one here um, is, is, is not alloyed, yes? Not alloyed, um, but a lot of these steels, yes, as you can see, are alloyed. They're alloyed in particular with chrome. And again, we know that chrome is added because of hardenability. That means that most of these, uh, these spring steels are actually in use when you use them. They're actually martensitic. Their microstructure is martensitic. Now, another thing that you will see in this uh, list is uh, silicon, silicon, silicon. Uh, it doesn't say silicon, but it is a relatively high silicon content. Why is that? Hmm? Uh, that's because these steels are <coughs> not deoxidized with aluminum, but with silicon. So, this, so the, uh, they're not aluminum killed in the, in the, in this, in the steel metallurgy. You, do, you don't aluminum kill it, you silicon kill them. And that avoids the problem of having these um, very um, hard um, aluminum oxide type inclusions in the spring steels, yes? The ones that give these very nasty uh, uh, fatigue failures hmm? or fractures. Hmm? Right, and you can see uh, st strength, strength levels very high also, okay? 
that's uh, most important. Just, yeah. um, the, uh, if you want to make a material more hardenable, uh, uh, you uh, typically add uh, a, um, excuse me, a molybdenum. That's uh, important. All right, so let's have, um, say, another uh, small thing here about the, the spring steels. Uh, spring steels um, also need to have very low carbon content. It, it's, uh, it was found that uh, the presence of uh, nitrogen is, has, is, is um, because of a uh, phenomenon of wire aging, yes, um, is negative for, um, for um, spring applications. Uh, so this number, this is an example here where the, uh, uh, the impact of nitrogen can be seen on a test that's being done on wire steel. It's you, you, make, you twist the wire, basically, and you count the number of twists before it breaks. Uh, very um, typical engineering test, right? And what you can see is that um, uh, the number of twists that you can make before the wire breaks uh, depends on the, the nitrogen content. The, the lower the nitrogen content, the higher the number of twists is. Yeah? Um, so um, in general, mm, um, you know, remember um, I told you uh, 40 ppm is typically what you can get in nitrogen levels if you use the BOF process, right? so the uh, blast furnace BOF route to make steels. Many wire makers no, are not necessarily uh, producing uh, their wires that way. They may be producing with electric arc furnace. In that case, their carbon levels may be three times that amount, 100, 150 ppm of nitrogen, right? And so they will have big problem making quality wire products. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happens there, of course, you can improve on the uh, secondary metallurgy um, by degassing. Uh, or alternatively, you can add boron, yes? And uh, so boron, in this case, is used to bind the nitrogen. Yeah. Um, right. Um, okay. Springs themselves, um, they're very different routes to make springs. Hmm? Um, if you're uh, we talk about suspension springs, for instance, the, the springs, uh, suspension springs of your car, yes? They can be made by hot forming or cold forming. Hmm? Yeah. Um, and um, usually, um, if, if you cold form them, we, you make coil type uh, springs. But you know, of course, that the, you have some uh, springs that are uh, leaf type, you know, so flat um, flat leaves you know, that you wind up. You know. um, those ones are made by hot forming uh, only. Uh, for instance, the suspension springs for, for light trucks, or you know, they're, they're leaf springs, right? they're not coils. And, and so those are made by, by hot forming. Uh, engine valve springs are always made by cold forming and, uh, and of course, as you uh, have noticed probably, is they're all coil type, okay? So ag again here, the, uh, between the production of a wire and the production of a spring, there's some steps in between, quite a few steps uh, in general. Um, and uh, the, um, in the, the first step, the, you know, you have a company that will do the, uh, you know, the, uh, put, make the metal uh, ready for the producer of springs, yes? Um, 
So the, uh, the customer one uh, uh, makes oil quenched and tempered wire, yes? Of the right dimensions, yes? So uh, generally this, the wire comes in, you know, it's about five to 13 millimeters in di uh, section. It's, it's coated so as to make wire drawing possible. The wire drawing um, <coughs> uh, uh, you cannot uh, wire draw uh, continuously. You have to do intermediate annealing steps, yes, uh, which are called uh, patenting because they involve this isothermal transformation, remember, to get uh, fine uh, perlite. Hmm? Um, so your your wire will here, for instance, be seven millimeters in uh, diameter. You do a second wire drawing to get the final uh, uh, diameter of your wire, and then you do austenitize this. You all quench it and you temper. So, so you've got this really hard wire now hmm, that is ready uh, to go to the spring manufacturer. And the spring manufacturer turns this wire into a, by cold forming, for instance, in a, um, um, a, a spring. Mm -hmm. this, the cold forming here uh, results in a lot of internal stresses, yes? So you remove them by a low temperature uh, heat treatment. Um, very often you do shot peening of uh, spring steels. Uh, the reason is to harden the surface. When you harden the surface, you introduce compressive stresses, residual compressive stresses, and that helps increase the fatigue life. Yes? Again, uh, you reduce the, the stresses with a uh, stress relief uh, treatment not so that it's fully, uh, so that the, the, um, the hardening of the surface is, is gone, but uh, just to get uh, your mechanical properties back. And then you preset the, um, the coil. Okay? And so you, you end up with a uh, material which can have um, you know, two gigapascals in strength. All right? So again, as I said, as I, 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 I said when, when we talk about wire sti uh, 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 steel applications, strength levels are easily 11, you know, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 and more. And actually, in the uh, high strength, for high strength wires, in particular bridge wire, the strengths are, uh, are even close to uh, 3 gigapascal. Mm -hmm. So there's a very uh, big difference with uh, the sheet products where we talked about, uh, where you know anything above a, a thousand megapascal is already considered ultra high strength. Hmm? And with wire steel products, it's very you know go, going above a gigapascal is very common. Uh, so um, right, and uh, uh, very different types of. Um, uh, uh, th uh, things uh, you can do to, um, uh, to make uh, bridge suspensions. Mm -hmm. You have, um, uh, of course, these, these uh, very tiny wires, yes? And, uh, and these strands are put together in you know, a special way to, to, to obtain this very high strength uh, cable. Mm -hmm. And you can have what is called, like, like in this case, open spiral strands. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, they're often made with hot dip galvanized high strength steel wires hmm? and, uh, and, and you can see the, the strand or the cable is built uh, by, by having different layers of uh, uh, wires which are helically round around each other, hmm? around the corner, core. The, um, and then you also have things, uh, uh, suspension uh, 
cables that look like this. Uh, these are locked strands. Uh, again, they're made of hot dip galvanized steel wires. Uh, and the inner core is made by round wires. You can see the round wires uh, and a few layers. And, and then at the, on the outside, you have one or two layers of Z-shaped wires. Uh, and these Z-shaped wires, um, uh, because of this Z-shape, they're self-locking. Yes? And you obtain a very compact and strong uh, uh, section. And note, uh, in, in order to make these material uh, very resilient yes, uh, to, uh, to fracture, the, all, the wires are always inclined to the force. Yes? And, and they're wrapped in different directions also. Yes? And then they consist of multiple strands um, Okay. Because of the applications are usually out are usually outdoors mm, for uh, cranes or for um, uh, bridges, as I said, suspension bridges. Interior application would be uh, elevators, for instance. Yes. Uh, there's always additional uh, corrosion protection on these um, things because uh, to avoid all problems of uh, corrosion, the zinc coating is very often applied to the wires themselves. Uh, and then waxes, epoxies, or high-density polyethylene coatings are applied on, on these uh, uh, products. So nowadays, you know, in, in the past, right, um, for these high-strength wire, people would use patented wire rod. Yeah? Yes. Uh, nowadays, the, the, uh, we use the technology that I introduced last week. We use uh, Stelmore uh, wire rod, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, enabled these, uh, the wire uh, mills to produce steel that can be drawn directly. You don't have to do an intermediate uh, uh, patenting process. It has a lower strength, of course, uh, and the microstructure is not adequate in the sense that you, you know this is not going to be the final product microstructure. Uh, in to increase the 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 strength of um, wires, typically used for cables. Yeah. Uh, the microstructure refinements, uh, typical microstructure refinement is used such as uh, refining the, uh, the perlite, but you can also use microalloying concepts. And uh, the interesting thing about the galvanizing of these wires is that um, the, uh, the zinc that you apply on these wires can actually be used as a very efficient lubricant during drawing, so you can uh, so when when zinc is applied on wire rod, yes, it gives uh, the possibility to achieve significant strength increase. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have you know two effects: you can increase the uh, the corrosion resistance, and you can improve the strength. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and and so nowadays. Uh, there are uh, producers who can make very high carbon steel uh, wire that's galvanized yes, uh, with very high strength levels mm, of the order of uh, 3 gigapascal, as I said. Mm, and that these are actually recent, relatively recent developments. Um, why is it so important uh, to, uh, to make fine wires? It's because the, the finer the wire is, yes, so... Uh, the stronger you can get the wire to be. So, and this is rather interesting effect. So if you look at the tensile strength, yes, as a function of the wire thickness for the same microstructure, hmm, you see that being able to make smaller diameter wire yes, allows you to achieve higher strengths. So you see in, in this, uh, this black line here, experimental 
uh, measurements of a steel with you know, close to 1% of carbon, yes, you see that you can achieve 6,000 megapascal hmm? uh, just by making a, a finer wire. Okay? All right. So um, this, this wire drawing is very simple. You just draw the, the, the wire through a, um, uh, to, to these uh, through circular dies, mostly. Hmm? And, um, uh, and, and usually it's, it's called cold drawing. Hmm? It, it doesn't have to be, by the way, it doesn't have to be a circular a die. You can have Z-shaped, X-shaped, or um, trapezoidal shapes. Uh, when you when you do the uh, the drawing, hmm? and then in between the steps of drawing, you do uh, the the patenting, right? Hmm? Where you uh, where you uh, can uh, re uh, uh, reconstruct the paralytic microstructure, fine paralytic microstructure, by um, Isothermally forming your uh, your perlite at around 500 degree uh, C, and and this very fine perlite is also has also very nice uh, wire drawing uh, behavior. So, uh, as I said, the uh, so originally the the high strength wire was very close to the uh, eutectoid composition. And you could achieve about uh, a little less than 3 gigapascal in strength at 0.7% of carbon. So the, the uh, evolution in recent times is to increase this strength level to um, 4 gigapascal hmm, by increasing the the carbon content. Okay. Nowadays, uh, I think the 4,000, there are not many people who can make this. Uh, this would be uh, industry standard for really high strength uh, steel wire. Now you have to be very careful, of course, when you increase the carbon to, uh, to make a very high strength steels because you don't want to have blocky cementite in your microstructure, right? Because blocky cementite is very brittle. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, uh, you see if I have a carbon content of this much, yes, and I cool down very slowly here, yes, the first phase that gets formed is cementite. Yeah? Uh, and in these steels, if you do regular heat uh, uh, cooling from austenite, th the phase you see on all the grain boundaries will be pro-eutectoid cementite. So that's a phase that has to be uh, suppressed. And certainly, in the case of another application for fine high-strength wire for tire cord, hmm? because that's the uh, composition of uh, carbon composition for um, tire cord, hmm? from the eutectoid to about 1%. Um, okay. Right, so um, what uh, do we do in, uh, for tire cord? It's very high strengths. Hmm? You uh, do uh, always work on the interlamellar spacing. You can also increase the, f the, the strength of the ferrite in the, um, in the um, perlite phase. Hmm? And, uh, and of course, what you do when you add carbon, you, you basically add you increase the amount of cementite. Hmm? Um, one of the things that um, um, people have worked on uh, to uh, improve uh, tire cord is uh, the work hardening of uh, the, the perlite by adding carbon, but also by uh, chromium addition. Turns out that the chromium, you can see it here, that chromium additions and these are chromium, these case chromium, chromium is in solution, right? It's not, it do, doesn't form, it's, it's not being used to, uh, to obtain a, a martensitic microstructure. It's added to 
increase the work hardening. So you can see here for these um, steels, the tire core composition in terms of carbon, you see that as I increase the, the chromium content, I can improve uh, the, the strength of the wire. What always works is a reduction of the diameter, so increasing the strain. Yeah, so you, uh, that's one of the um, important things in, uh, in wire drawing is try to achieve the very thin wires. Yes. And uh, in principle, you could uh, go further by adding, you know, trying to push the amount of carbon even higher. But 0.9 seems a little bit to be the uh, the limit uh, because of risk of pro eutectoid cementite formation and that embrittles the material um, very uh, badly. Hmm? Okay, so uh, it's an example here of what happens uh, or the big difference when, when, you, when you just take regular ferrite, yes, and you deform it by drawing to huge amounts of deformation, a strain of nine, yes. Uh, you, you can barely reach, uh, you reach uh, um, about two, 2,500 in strength. In, uh, perlite in, yeah, will achieve, <coughs> excuse me, double that amount at half the amount, half the, the strength. Okay, so that's basically the, you know, the, the wonderful property of, of that a perlite has and that's being uh, used in uh, wire products. Okay, so uh, fast cooling is important, yes. And so let's have a look at a typical example here. Uh, for instance, for uh, to make a, a cable. Hmm? So you will start, for instance, with a wire rod that will contain, say, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 carbon. Hmm? It's five millimeter in diameter. It's, with that amount of carbon, it's already very hard, yes? Okay, uh, so you descaled uh, uh, and you do a fi first wire drawing, yes? You do a patenting, so you, you have to get the microstructure uh, basically to recrystallize and anneal the microstructure so you can continue reducing the, uh, the diameter of your uh, wire. So at first wire drawing you're down to three millimeters, second wire drawing one to two millimeters, second patenting one millimeter. Hmm? You see also that um, uh, that after, because the patent thing, you recreate a defect-free microstructure, the, the strength drops, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, and then comes a brass coating. Uh, brass coating is often applied to, uh, to do these uh, drawing operations, and for these, uh, certainly the final ones, and the, and improve adhesion properties of the wires. Uh, but uh, before the, the first and the second wire drawing, uh, there is, of course, uh, there may be applications of uh, lubricants, which, which, is, which is not shown here. Right? Uh, the, after the third wire drawing, we're down to uh, a tent to, uh, to half a millimeter, and the strength is, is close to 3,000. Uh, uh, megapascal, and then we can do the cabling, make cables out of this of this wire. When we uh, increase the uh, carbon beyond this 0.9 percent, yes, um, obviously we cannot, because I told you. The, the products you can make are, are not going to be products which use the perlitic microstructure, right? Because you, it's very difficult, if not impossible, n to avoid pro-eutectoid cementite, right? Which is brittle. 
So what, what we see is you get applications where you have, uh, such as bearing steels, where you, where you use the steel, the, excuse me, the high carbon, to make a high carbon martensite, a very high carbon martensite. And the, the example here is, is bearing steels. So if we uh, look at the bearing steels, uh, there are different types of bearing steels. We, and I'm not going to go into the technology of bearing steels, but basically what you have are bearing steels which are fully martensitic. Huh? And we call them through hardened steel. Or we have bearing steels which are surface hardened. So at the exterior you have a very high carbon martensite and at the interior you have a more ductile uh, uh, microstructure. Hmm? Um, so let's look at um, the difference. Well, the uh, through hardened uh, materials are, they all contain uh, carbon, about 1%, and uh, they also contain um, one to one and a half, in some cases close to two percent of chromium. That's to make the material very hardenable, whatever the size of the, uh, the bearing. And there is also molybdenum here hmm, to improve the hardenability. In the case of the case hardening steels, uh, case hardening um, um, type, what do we see? A much lower carbon content. Yeah? So uh, the, um, the way you can make, um, so, so the, even if you make martensite here, it's going to be a much softer martensite. So the way you, you actually can make a very high carbon martensite in this case is by carburizing, carburizing the uh, material. So uh, introducing the carbon from the, the outside. Okay. I, I thought I had an example of a no I don't know. I thought I had an example of a, um, a, a ball bearing production, but I guess not. Um, so another uh, uh, application of um, wire uh, steel is um, pre-cutting steels. Um, we have a, uh, a relatively wide uh, range of composition, basic carbon composition basically depends on the, the application. Uh, free cutting steels are basically steels that are easy to machine, yes? Um, and uh, in general, um, this, uh, this is done by increasing, adding uh, sulfur. Sulfur to relatively high levels, 0.2 to 0.4. And as a result, there's lots of manganese sulfides in these uh, steels. And uh, when you make something on a, uh, with this steel, the part, the, um, uh, the chip, what we call the, the, the chip formation uh, is uh, much better. In, in what way? Uh, the, the chips break off more easily because of the presence of this um, manganese sulfides. The sulfur is present as manganese sulfide. Yeah? And uh, there is much less buildup here, this which is called this uh, cold welded uh, material at the edge of the tool here, that buildup is much smaller. So as a consequence, the damage to your, your tool during machining is, very, is, is much more limited. And, and so that's why we call it free cutting or uh, machining steels. Hmm? Hmm. Um, there are many, uh, because of the typical application, in case of wire steel, you don't see this very much, but for uh, bar steels, you will have uh, more products that are, that are uh, free cutting steels. 
Now, um, is this really required to, to have this much sulfur? Not necessarily. Um, uh, in many cases, you can actually have much lower values. Hmm? And the reason is because, obviously, tools are getting better, and also uh, these, uh, the machining, CNC machining uh, technology uh, doesn't require really these very high level of um, sulfur. Uh, but apparently, from what I, I hear, um, it's still important when you're drilling holes. And, you know, when you have, uh, you're building something and you need to drill holes, drilling holes is still uh, quite a challenge uh, because, you, you, because of the tools, uh, drilling tools, apparently. Now, uh, watch out about these uh, steels, yes? Uh, so high sulfur contents are, are a bad thing when you have, when you think about mechanical properties and certainly in cases where uh, the part that you will be making is used in conditions uh, where stress corrosion cracking may be an issue. So for instance, parts related to um, uh, tubes, yes, hmm? where uh, uh, there you can have stresses on the part and also um, corrosive uh, uh, atmospheres or environments that you have to uh, also avoid using this kind of steels. And finally, um, a lot of uh, 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 wire uh, production. Hmm? and bar uh, mills produce uh, rebar. Rebar stands for reinforcement bar. Yeah? Reinforcement bar, uh, and, and you're all familiar with these um, bars that may be twisted or, um, yes, and, and that you see on building sites. Hmm? Typically, um, less than 0.2% of carbon. Why, why would that be? Uh, well, because very often these, um, um, you have to do on-site welding of these rebars, yes? Uh, so you, you, ease of weldability is important. They don't have that very much uh, strength, mm? yield strengths up to 50, tensile strengths can be up to 500. So we're really, and, and, and this is a, a really co very commercial product. Mm? So plain carbon steels are used. Mm? And if you want higher strengths, strength levels, higher strength levels are achieved, for instance, by twisting the, uh, the rebar or by uh, uh, vanadium microalloying. Hmm? Okay. Having said this, you can, you can still do quite clever things with, uh, even with rebar uh, and improve the, the properties without really uh, going into uh, you know, uh, big expenses when it comes to um, uh, alloying additions. For instance, um, uh, one of the ways to process rebar yes, is to, to, make, to, to give them a, um, in, instead of giving them a ferrite perlite microstructure, is, is to give them a uh, a structure that will contain a uh, martensite on the outside, making them hard, and then gradually uh, decreasing the hardness and getting tougher uh, uh, perlitic microstructure in the center. So um, how is this uh, done? Hmm? So when you, you uh, make your bar, hmm? um, the, you do a, the cooling in an uninterrupted fashion. Hmm? So you do a fast cooling yeah, so that the surface cools rapidly, yes, rapidly, and, be, uh, uh, and it's cooled rapidly below the MS temperature. So, so the surface turns into martensite. Yeah? The, um, the center, however, of the bar yeah, cools much more slowly. Why is that? Because you apply this... Uh, cooling for a very short time, like like one second, very uh, uh, strong cooling, yes? So the, the surface turns into uh, martensite. The center 
doesn't feel this fast cooling at all and cools down slowly. Yeah? So that means that um, the center is at this temperature, still at 900, when the surface is at 200 degrees C. Yes? So what happens, the next step, you get the temperatures get equalized. Yes? Hmm? The, and, and this means that the martensitic, uh, the martensitic uh, surface heats up again and gets and becomes tempered hmm? okay so if I look at a, a bar a rebar that's been processed in this way I can see at the outside on the outside yes this is for a relatively uh, um, 1.6 centimeter rebar you can see at the outside I have martensite and then gradually I get softer, softer constituents until at the middle I basically get uh, a soft ferrite prolytic microstructure. And this way I can get a, uh, um, rebar properties that are more interesting without really having to um, invest in, the, um, in additional costs. Yes? Because the, the, the quenching and the tempering is being done simultaneously. Hmm? Uh, this process where you, um, uh, where you, do, uh, you use this, where you quench something and then you just let the part reheat the quenched area, yeah? it's, it's called auto-tempering. So the, the material tempers itself when it equalizes the temperature. Hmm? All right, good. So we've um, ended uh, our session on uh, wire and bar products. Mm -hmm. Very important in this is, again, as I said, the, the central role of carbon as alloying element, in particular in relation to uh, perlite. Very important that to realize that many of these products uh, we're working on microstructure refinement, particularly redu reducing the interlamellar uh, spacing. Hmm. All right, um, good. Well, so we've come to the end of uh, lecture today. Hmm. I'd like to remind everybody that uh, so we will meet Monday at 11 for the final quiz, okay, which will include today's material, okay, and it will be, I promise a true or false 